Well, hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Writer's Parachute, where we are guiding writer and author dreams to a perfect landing. And today we have with us a very special guest, Jen Selinski. We're going to be talking about her two children's books, You Are You and Bunny's Song. Uh, we'll talk to her in just a bit. But as always, we go ahead and start the show with a little bit of housekeeping. So don't forget to smash that like button go ahead and subscribe on YouTube and many of the podcasting channels now will allow you to subscribe so that you don't miss an episode of the Writer's Parachute. Don't forget to share with friends. We have a lot of writing information tips and we always have a great interview with the author of the week. So we hope that you do share that out. If you would like to be on the Writer's Parachute, please do contact me. You can contact me at info at writers parachute, or excuse me, info at the writers parachute.com. And uh, we'll get back to you with available dates. It looks like right now we are booking into August and September. So if that uh, goes well with your schedule, please contact us and let us know. We'd be happy to have you on the Writer's Parachute. And of course, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Writer Parachute with no S. So we hope that you take that into consideration. So it is the month of May, and we're going to be talking about writing. We're talking about writing, the act of writing, and some tips to get that best writing out there. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about using pronouns. Now, I don't mean using pronouns as an identity or a gender identity, but this is more about using it in place of a name for a person, such as she said, he said, they said. Uh, so what I want you to be aware of is if you have more than one person of the same gender in that scene, it is very difficult to follow if you're using a he, she, or they, especially if you have more than two people or more than one person of the same gender that you were referring to as a he or a she, then it is very difficult for the reader to follow. You can say she said, but the reader may be asking which she, which she said that, or uh, I know that it's very common now to drop the dialogue tags. And while I don't disagree with that fully, I think you have to be very careful and make sure that you have your speaker doing something, some sort of action to make sure that the reader does follow along and does understand. So if you're writing and you find that your writing is full of the he's and she's, I want you to go back and read and make sure that it's very clear which he, which she, which they, which them. So be careful using those pronouns because sometimes they can lead you down a crazy path of the unknown. So I hope that's a helpful topic for you today and we will be back next week with another topic but right now we want to have a conversation with our guest Jen Zielinski. Her book You Are You is an imagined 2019 best children's book award winner and her other book Bunny's Song uh, they are children's books. Jen was born in Pennsylvania, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She earned a bachelor's degree for English, then a master's degree in library science in 2003 and 2004, respectively. As a former librarian, Jen now dedicates her time to writing with over 200 published titles, including poetry. She has achieved great success. Her work is available through most retailers and have be, has been featured in the Courier Journal, Pennant Magazine, Explorer Magazine, Lifar Magazine, and Indiana Libraries. She is a senior editor for Pennant Publications, as well as editing for Pennant Pulpit Magazine, Hydra Publications, and Seventh Day Star or Seventh Star Press. She's a freelance contributor to the News and Tribune newspapers. I believe those are in Indiana as well as well as providing editing, proofreading, and ghostwriting services to individual authors. Jen currently resides in Sellersburg, Indiana with her husband. Welcome to the Writer's Parachute, Jen. How are you Thank today? You. I'm great. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm very happy to be here. Well, we're always glad to have you. And it's like, I've not interviewed such a well uh, written such a diversely written author before. So I'm very excited to talk to you about it. 
and not only talk to you about your children's books, but we're going to be talking a little bit about the the breadth of the uh, con contributions that you're putting out there in these publications and magazines. I know a lot of my audience members would be very curious and interested as to how you go about doing that, because that is another avenue for a lot of writers to perfect their writing, but to also be known and seen and respected in your field. So I do applaud that. So as we said, you've written and published over 200 books, but today we're going to be focusing on the children's books titles, which is You Are You and Bunny Song. So what inspired you to write children's books? It's a good question. The first one that popped into my mind back in 2005, shortly after I moved here to Sellersburg, was about a bored bunny, and I like the anthropomorphic animals, and I like stories like that. And I, you know, think about how it was partially inspired by writers block and how people don't always know what to do. So I thought, we can write a children's book about that. And I started my first draft with some crude illustrations. I still have them, but they didn't make it into the book. And um, that was basically the inspiration for that. And that's, you know, one of my favorite subjects and the anthropomorphic animals that people like. Mm -hmm. And um, I really enjoyed doing that. And that was my first traditionally published book back in 2016. One of my publishers, Pennant Publications, picked it up. And it's probably, you know, one of my most successful titles so far, and people really enjoy that. Right. Well, we're, we're very excited to have you. So, so what led you to write these two books specifically for the children's audience? I mean, I, I, I get that you're bored and you're finding stuff mm -hmm. to read and, and, and this was an idea you had, but, you know, I, I often find that, that people just assume that children's books are so easy to write but as you and I well know that's not it's always true. not always the case no there's lots of drafting and I've done some ghost writing for children's books for some of my clients and you know I just you know make sure it's as good as it can be for them you know that they accept it mm -hmm. all right well so that's take... very exciting so I you know and I read both the books I really like them they're they're beautifully illustrated and um they're phenomenal <laughs> illustrations yeah, and they're they're very they're very well written. I I would recommend they probably up to about a seven or eight year old. Uh, I think they're um, probably a little more geared toward your five to six years old, but I think you could go right. all the way up to probably a seven or eight year old. So, but you also write poetry and nonfiction titles. So, what was the biggest or most surprising difference that you found? writing in these other genres when you switched over to children's books or back and forth? Usually I, I'm surprised at how successful my children's titles are overall. Poetry is, as many writers know, is difficult to sell, which is what I started out doing. And I figured I, I just wanted to try every genre possible. There's still a few I haven't quite tried yet, like mystery or horror titles or things like that. But I just want to stretch myself out in every avenue I can. So I decided for some reason I wanted to do, even though I don't have children, I wanted to write children's books mm -hmm. and they've been pretty well received. And some of the ones I've written and edited and ghostwritten first, other fellow authors, they enjoyed the work. I helped them with that too. Okay, well, there was one that kind of caught my eye that was, uh, and I think it's more than one book, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I went and looked at your complete list, which is rather long at 200 <laughs> plus books, uh, but you also wrote some like uh, nonfiction kind of uh, uh, the life of the, the members of the band Duran Duran, so I found that was interesting, and I just wanted you to kind of briefly talk about what that entails and what audience that you're looking for for that kind of a, a book. Basically, uh, I was, as the, a lot of these ideas came to me back shortly after I moved out here and must have gotten inspired to write more. I, they're my favorite band at the time. Now my favorite band is Genesis, but I still like Duran Duran. And um, it was my bestseller uh, even before, back when it was self-published, people would purchase that. But now I had a company in England called, um, I can't remember that. But anyway, they, they picked Weimar UK, Weimar UK publishers, and they picked that up last year and it came out on July 23rd. He even had a radio interview and he licensed all the photos and has to worry about the imagery. And I've never met or interviewed any of the members of the band, but people, you know, that's overall my bestseller and people are really seem to be impressed with that the most, especially because of the quality of the publication, the fact that people are still interested after all these years and a group that was primarily famous, you know, in the eighties. Mm -hmm. Well, but, you yeah, know, there's yeah. still a large following, large following nowadays. 
Great. Well, and it did kind of pique my curiosity. I'm thinking, wow, okay, well, that's an interesting topic. So you, we also mentioned a little bit that, you know, that you work as a freelance contributor for the news and the Tribune newspapers and as a senior editor for Pennant Publications. So I want to know how you got there and what do you think has done uh, how this has helped you improve your writing and your overall approach to the books that you write? For the News and Tribune, actually, they used to be two separate papers. And up until I think about 10 or 12 years ago, they merged into one paper. And basically that I've been trying to work with them for years and they recently switched to editors and there's nothing wrong with the previous editor, but this new editor just hired me as soon as he saw my resume, didn't have any journalistic experience or courses in journalism in college, but he took a chance on me and you know people were really happy with my work in fact I have five articles oh, which I'm in the, when, when I when I covered earlier today for a story and a couple which we could do within the few, next few weeks so I'm really excited about that because it's a real lucrative and a fun fun process something I never in a million years thought would have happened so I'm really you know learning it's, I don't want to call it journalism or it's not a column I'm not sure exactly what to call it but you know it helps me increase my genre as my fan base because all the people it circulates to see my name in there mm -hmm. at the top and they'll say hey did you write this or this is pretty cool so the fact so, that i'm just getting out there to all these audiences within the county with so more the of like county. an opinion piece or review piece or something of that nature or mostly um not really a column but mostly describing events and ah. a few things before the events and i interview local businesses for the special magazine the business magazine they have every I think it's a bi-monthly so they have it every two months so I've done a few of those as well mm -hmm. that's how I started and but luck I just really lucked into it it was just a real divine intervention there I just really enjoyed working for the paper and I didn't you know I didn't know this person he had just taken over and I thought well I might as well send my resume my cover letter which and then about two days later he got back to me this was last September now I've been with him for almost a year and I really enjoy it Okay, so uh, how do you think that that has um, changed the way you write and the way you approach writing, writing in all these different genres and for all these different publications? I think it's it's good to experience every every genre I can. I I wasn't I've had a few sample articles. I've never really written for a newspaper before. I had a couple back when the other editor was there. She said she'd be interested in my work, but it never came to fruition. But I just, you know, I think it just strengthens every genre. I can feel confident in producing work, the happier I can be, because I'm getting rid of overcoming barriers, which I thought would not be possible years ago. I don't thought I could never write for a newspaper. I seldom read newspapers then, and but now that it's almost second nature since I've started with the News and Tribune. And um, it's just, you know, it's, you know, it hasn't really affected my writing in a negative way, but, um, you know, it's just one more thing that I can enjoy and add to my livelihood. Mm -hmm. It's well, beyond a hobby now. So that's, that's what makes me happy. Well, and, you know, as we know, as writer, you know, as writers, every experience and every emotion that we go through in, in exploring these different writing avenues make us better writers because we, we always learn something from, you know, going outside of our comfort zone. And I think that's a lot of what writers need to do is be outside of their comfort zone to, to, exactly. stretch, to stretch their abilities a little bit. So what advice would you give to other writers who want to see their work included in publications or magazines? How would they go about getting started? Usually, like I said, I was very, very just lucky in this respect, but um, the fact that I just really first work on your cover letter and resume, make sure you have all your pertinent work experiences and talk about what, you know, what you've accomplished and and perhaps in the cover letter, what you hope to accomplish. And in this case, I didn't know the person. A lot of people will say, knowing someone gets you in certain certain areas, but this, that was not the case. It was just a serendipity in a good way. But um, I'd recommend contacting, you know, directly, if there's available information, direct the direct main publisher for newspapers and periodicals and inquire about submitting work and what their policies are. and perhaps just ask them, you know, if they'd like a copy of their resume or cover letter, which, you know, is good to have both in that respect, especially when, when it's somebody you don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, so. just, just a little caveat, you know, there is HARO, which is H-A-R-O.com, which is help a reporter out. 
and, and generally they have a list of topics and subjects that they're looking for somebody that may be knowledgeable on or can write about it or they can interview for. So, uh, you know, I think that's another thing, but, you know, to your point, yeah, keep pitching, keep finding new ideas, keep- Don't going. give up. <laughs> yeah, keep going, you know, start small, start locally because you're more likely to get a yes from a local small newspaper. And then once you get your foot in the door, then you can use that to kind of leverage yourself up to the bigger publications. So, uh, and, you know, and think about the publications in your genre, you know, obviously if you're writing children's books, look at all of the magazines and, um, you know, newspapers and things that are out there, even online, you know, for, parents and teachers and librarians and schools about children's books see if you can submit to them there's also uh you know if you're writing for science fiction there's a lot of magazines and uh, and different online uh places that you can write articles and and subject matter for them so you know it's it's a matter of just doing your own research it's like don't don't wait for somebody to come up to you and say hey you know you want to write for the newspaper because that's not likely to happen <laughs> not not necessarily <laughs> yeah so um well we, we really appreciate your your um your help with that so what has been the biggest challenge or obstacle for you on your journey writing publishing talking about all of these different avenues that you take and what did you learn from it it's just perseverance i've there were several times since you know i moved here and i wanted to got my library career which i've always you know that was my quote backup career i really wanted to do this on writing editing proofreading so i just kept at it there were several times where i got frustrated i said i quit my husband would say no you're not you're not going to quit and he knew he knew me too well to know that i'd not do that but just the keeping you know keeping up your perseverance is, and you know sometimes things can be demoralizing especially because i've received lots of rejections over the years and you know like some people i've kept i didn't wallpaper my room with them but some people have actually kept their rejections to remind them you know that things do get better if you keep persevering things can go on and not to give up um you know any any small victory does count it's something you can include on your resume and your bio um so, you know, now that the fact that I've been able to do this for my livelihood and people are starting to recognize me, especially locally, it's, that makes me happy, you know, that my name's getting out there and people are looking just at all my different materials and more personally, for as challenge wise for writing, I'm not much of a person who, I'm not much of a cook and all, that's not the only thing I enjoy doing, but one of my challenge was, was to write a cookbook. So I actually did three, one for desserts, one for appetizers, one for entrees, and I'm working on a group compilation cookbook for pen publications. And it was just a difficult process because I didn't know anything about writing or cooking that much in that area. So that was a good, good you know, obstacle to overcome so I can get myself into another genre because people do, you know, when I go to signings and, mm -hmm. and just in general, people do like those cookbooks and some are, you know, recipes that I've had over the years. My mother kept a couple from the family, mm -hmm. which, you know, are included. So that was something personally I thought would be difficult, but you know, now I'm actually even actually enjoy doing doing that. And I've had a couple of them selected recipes in one of the local magazines, and they feature that, and they give you a little, I think, as a ten dollar gift card. But you know, I get my name in print with the with the recipe, and people will say they've seen it in there. And same with the paper. Let's say I saw your article, and it makes me happy to know that people enjoy it. Well, you know, and this is where I find out, you know, if there's something that you don't know how to do or something you want to write about, but you feel like you can't, sometimes the best books are from the perspective of somebody that is, you know, not knowledgeable. And they're like, you know, I don't know how to cook, but you know what, I'm going to write a cookbook of what I learned. And I'm sure that when you got to the end of these cookbooks that you learned a whole bunch of things about cooking and you're probably a little bit better cook than you are now. But also too it's like i i've been cooking for years i you know i'm a southern woman it's like something that 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 we're kind of you know it's in our dna to to, to cook for large you know amounts of food with lots of butter and stuff in that so cooking was never something that's outside but i do find that like when i'm working with my grandkids and trying to teach them some of my recipes i have to stop and remember they weren't 
raised in the same environment. They don't have the benefit of growing up with, you know, all of the, the uh, large family that I grew up with where everybody was cooking and it was kind of just a girl thing. And we all would talk about, you know, how we do things and how to do it better. So it's just me. And I have to remember that they don't have that knowledge. So sometimes it's easier to come from someone who isn't as knowledgeable teaching than it is from somebody that does have a lot of experience and knowledge because we we forget we forget all the little tips and tricks that we that we learned along the way that that we aren't always imparting to our audience so i think that's an excellent idea and and i do encourage anybody that if if you want to try something you want to do something then do approach it whether you write the book or not it's a good writing exercise is to write down in a journal, how did you do that? You know, how, what did you learn? You know, it, it might actually be a really good book for other people that want to learn the same things that are afraid. You know, sometimes uh, as authors, we're, 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 uh, we're breaking the ceiling for the other people and giving them kind of a little insight. You know, a lot of times we refer to ourselves as Sherpas, you know, we've been up the mountain, we may not know everything, but at least we know the way, so. Um, you know, sometimes that's a good way to do that. So um, I wanted to know with all of these different books and genres that you're writing in, I mean, you know, this is, I, I really have never seen another author that has this diverse of a catalog and I do applaud that. So I'm just Thank curious, you. what is your marketing strategy for this many diverse genres because i do have a few other uh you know authors and writers that listen that they write in different things and it's like they always get frustrated it's like i have to you know i have to market this book this way for this audience and then i have to market a different way for another audience and sometimes that becomes overwhelming and exhausting so i'm curious what your ideas on getting um this entire catalog of, of books and genres out to the public Basically, um, a lot of marketing is, you know, done by most of the authors today, except for perhaps a few um, exceptions. We big with the large presses like Simon and Schuster, but mm -hmm. you know, it's it's necessary just to, you know, don't have to do much. If even a photo with a hashtag or anything on Twitter or other social media accounts, you know, including links to your page and saying, "Hey, this is my bestseller," which I do occasionally. People will like it. People will start to know it, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like I said, Mark. Marketing doesn't have to be difficult. It's time consuming, but you know, but once you once you you're established, people start spreading word of mouth. And the fact that I have my most of my books are self published on the Amazon platform, and the fact that people can look at my URL and see the titles, mm -hmm. and they can pick which ones they liked as a farewell gift to one of my to all my former coworkers at the library. I gave, let them each pick out a book that they'd like. So they scrolled through my 15 plus pages of over 200 books, and you know, they said you know, I'd like this one, I'd, or I'd like this for my grandkids, or something along those lines, but, um, you know, once you get word of mouth, and people looking at any material that's out there, that's available for them, they don't have to wait for it, and that gets them excited about your work. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and it does, you know, I, I agree with you, it's like, the more you write, the more you're recognized, and the more you become a trusted author, because they know what they're going to get from you, whether it's in a different genre or not, they do know what kind of quality, uh, and, you know, I know that in the children's market, it's like most children's authors who publish more rather than less are more recognized simply because the parents know they can go back to them time and time again and they know the quality that they're going to get even if it's a different story a different subject they know that that quality is going to be what they expect same thing with going into schools and stuff like that i do find it interesting that, that you offer a, a lot of tips and, and yeah it's sometimes i do think that authors make the marketing a little more difficult than it needs to be exactly and, you and know you focus focus on your work and the rest you know to just be leading to that you know for, suffer for your art not for having them having them market your art <laughs> right well and and also too the nice thing about having such a deep catalog is that if you've got a book that's not doing well then you can pull it out of your backlist and go hey you know what it's going to be free for you know a few days or i'm going to discount it and get you know a little more market not only to that book but to you and your other catalog of 
of titles. So, uh, you know, I agree, write more, get more out there, you know, That's right. Um, you know, you never know. I know that, uh, you know, most, most readers are very eclectic in the genres that they read in that, you know, I do write in children's books, but I also read sci-fi. I also read romance. I also read poetry, you know, so, you know, if I can go to one author and see a bunch of different stuff, it's like, I know I'm going to be going back and, and checking out some more of your books, but, um, you know, that, that is, that is good. I mean, that becomes a trusted source for me when I don't, have something I want to read. So uh, I, I think that's, it's, it's amazing. I'm very impressed with your, uh, Thank you. with your catalog and with your work ethic. I know you say that you don't have one, but I would, I would <laughs> differ with you. I think that your catalog of books proves that you have a very strong work ethic. So um, how would you say that listeners can find out more information about you, your books, your list of other books, again, numbering 200 plus, any kind of updates or anything on events that you're having coming up? So where would they find that? Well, I haven't, up, I'll be honest, I haven't had time to update my website in a while, but I do have a lot of local author events and book signings, but the best place is basically where I have my whole catalog on Amazon, as well as some of the self-published materials on Smashwords, Lulu, mm -hmm. um, you know, other publications, even on Barnes and Noble for both my self-published and traditionally published titles, just um, any major retailer bookstore. And I think mm -hmm. even walmart.com has a few of mine as well. Okay. But yeah, that's where you can find my Facebook page on both a personal and an author account. I'm on Twitter, okay. you know, well, you know, Instagram and, you know, but basically I recommend my Amazon catalogs. That's where people mm -hmm. seem to see most of my material. Okay, and you keep that one pretty uh, updated as far as uh, events and things that they might want to come and see you if they're, if they're local. All Actually, right, I well, thought thinking. about that yet, but that's something I could do in the future. I haven't before my website, which is the links to my social media pages and all my articles, which were published in prior interviews. But that's a good idea about, um, you know, including events, sometimes pennant publications, their website, they'll put a couple lo local author events to their authors. I've had them there before in the past. Mm -hmm. one way to get the word out about you know where to find my work right well and of course just a reminder to our uh, audience members we will list all of the links to all of jen's work uh to her website to all of her social media accounts as she said she's on facebook twitter and did you say instagram instagram what? yes okay so we will have all those links for you at the end uh, in the show notes. So do go check those out. And we will also include her, um, her link to the Amazon uh, catalog of all of her books, the 200 plus books and uh, a list of other retailers that that you can go check out her work. So um, do you have any kind of upcoming events or anything that you think our listeners needs to know about? It's mm, a good question. I'm um, depending on where I have most of my events are local. I have something in uh, northern Kentucky called Imaginarium, which is a three day. Um, that's where Seven Star Press and Hydra, two of the people I work for, are involved. That's going to be in early July, and, you know, mostly local things such as that. And um, there's one in Jeffersonville, Indiana. It's called Purrs in the City, a cat charity, which I did really well last year. I had my record number of books sold. All the money goes for kitties um, and local shelters, all the, you know, and you get to bring an item to auction off and mm -hmm. get to sell books. And this year they're expanding to a new larger venue. So I was one of the first people to be offered a spot, which I took up right away. And um, just local things like that and a couple other, mm -hmm. there's a Sellersburg Celebrates Festival every August. And usually our, my Sellersburg Writers Group, we haven't ever meet much, but um. You know, I do that every every couple of years and things like that locally, mostly. Um, I haven't done any large, large scale, like national. I did have a couple of Barnes and Noble book signings mm -hmm. in my hometown of Cranberry Township, one in um, Kentucky. But like I said, those those aren't very often, you know, I haven't done anything large scale regarding that yet. But hopefully one day. OK, well, you know. If you're in the Indiana, Kentucky area, please go check out her website or her uh, Amazon page to get updates on those local events for you. And of course, we want to have you come back in, and talk again about more of your books. Obviously, we can't cover all of them. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we go ahead and pull the report on our tip of the week? 
I just want to say to keep keep persevering. There are times where you just feel like you don't want to do it. There are times where you get writer's block, even though you want to do it. You can't. You feel like you can't do it, but it's just you got to persevere through it and take some time off. There are my longest break without writing anything was 11, I think 11 months back in several years ago. Now I don't have as much time for writing because I'm editing, but which is, you know, still to me, that's an accomplishment. I do a lot of developmental and content editing as well, mm -hmm. you know, to go with that. I just did a development. I know it's one of the books for pen publications, which took a little longer, but I think it helps mm -hmm. the, the other author. And that's why, you know, I do the same with my ghost writing and make sure everything meets their approval and Mm -hmm. makes them happy and I think that's another lucrative venue but you know as far as the papers and magazines I know it's sometimes difficult you kind of have to be famous to get famous if that makes any sense mm -hmm. but right <laughs> you just got to keep moving you know 10 years ago I didn't have any of this hardly and God has richly blessed me because of that but um you know he's got to keep moving and just keep pushing on and pursue your passion so mm -hmm. so it can be a career one day if you you know if you um, enjoy what you do you never work a day in your life <laughs> right I, I love as the saying goes yeah I love going into uh you know to schools to talk to kids about my books and about writing and stuff like that and I generally start my conversation with I have the greatest book job in the world I get to make stuff up for a living that's right I mean you know can you imagine as a kid if somebody told you there was a job out there where you didn't you know you didn't have to tell the truth you just get to make up stuff for the rest of your life it's like i would have never believed them and it's it's amazing i love my job and i know that obviously that you do too so we well, thank definitely. you for here with us today so i'm going to jump over and we're going to pull the ripcord on our writing marketing and publishing tip of the week this week we're going to talk a little bit about what jen brought up about having balance and perseverance with your writing now some of that comes in with writer's block and i'm just going to tell you my thoughts on writer's block i think writer's block oftentimes happens when you've kind of written yourself into a corner or you plotted yourself into a corner or you're forcing the characters or even if you're writing nonfiction, you're forcing the information into a corner where it cannot breathe so um, i take the journalist approach to that and i start interviewing either myself or the characters in my book if we're talking about fiction even in a children's book because i guarantee you you're going to come up with some really interesting answers and you're going to find a way sometimes it's just backing up and taking a second approach to it um you know it, it's you know part of plotting is really thinking through you know if i go this way what's going to happen is there a cliff there that i'm going to have to figure out how to cross over if i go this way am i going to have to cut down a tree those sort of things are are what we generally think through in plotting now as an intuitive writer i don't do a lot of pre-plotting i have an idea and a plan but i don't do a lot of it so if that is where you are and you are more of an intuitive writer and you aren't more of a planner then I would say that maybe just taking a second look, moving back away from it, possibly going and working on another project, or just start interviewing the characters or even yourself if it's nonfiction and try and find out what seems to be the problem. I think that oftentimes helps you overcome a writer's block. But beyond that, you know, to be a good writer, and to be a consistent writer, you have to create a habit. And to create a habit, you have to have something you're passionate about. Oftentimes, what when people say that, you know, oh, I picked up this, this book and I was writing on it and then I laid it down for a really long time. I think if you go back and be honest with yourself, you'll find that you've lost the passion for either that subject or that topic, or it wasn't there to begin with. It was just an idea. Now, ideas are great and sometimes they're great on paper and then they should be set aside until their time comes but again if you're not passionate about what you're working on then you are going to run into problems but again habit does help setting aside specific time to work even if that's only 10 to 15 minutes a day if you are consistently doing that even if it's only three or four days a week, if you are consistently doing that, you will create the habit, your mind will shift into that writing mode. What I find often for me, 
when I'm not doing well with my writing, it's because my mind is either too full of the coulda, woulda, shouldas, like I should be loading the dishwasher or, you know, what am I going to have for dinner? Do I need to go grocery shopping? Oh, wait, I need to make that dentist appointment. Those things do clog up the, the creative process. So I do take a note from um, the artist way and that's like Julia Cameron. And she talks about dumping all of the extraneous information out of your head. Now she suggests you do it in morning pages when you first get up in the morning. If you're a night writer, that may not work for you. Or if you write in the afternoon, that may not work for you. So I take it a little bit further. And before I start my writing time, I will sit down and try and get all the what coulda, woulda, shouldas out of my brain and clear the palette so that I can work and then get into my habit of writing for however long. Oftentimes what I'll find is even if I don't feel like I'm in the writing mode or I feel like I am pulling these words one at a time, like I'm pulling my back teeth out, after a while you'll start to feel the flow come. And again, that is about creating habit, about having passion, about having a schedule, but then again, having your attention focused on that creative, getting rid of the coulda, woulda, shoulda's. And then the last thing is expectations. So I'm just going to talk about that is in reference to balance. We have to have realistic expectations about what we can and cannot do. Uh, people talk about word counts rather than time. So they're like, well, I, I wanna get so many words in a day. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good gauge for how well you're doing and how far you're progressing. But I caution you to give yourself extraordinary word counts. So if you feel that you can write 5,000 words a day, great. But I would say set your goal a little bit lower. Set your goal at the most you think you could write on your worst day. And the reason I say that is because what happens if you don't reach your goals oftentimes we get very discouraged and then we feel like we need to catch up the next day and not only exceed the goal that we have for that day but go up go back and catch up from the day before and then this this continues on and on and on where if you set a lower goal so instead of the 5,000 words a day you make it a thousand words a day and you sail right past it every day as if it's nothing if a thousand words doesn't work for you, then lower it again to 500 words, to 100 words, two sentences, whatever it is, make your goals attainable. This is what I talk about, about expectations. You know, don't say that, you know, after a long week of work, you're going to spend all Friday, Saturday, and Sunday writing. That's not realistic. You still have to sleep. You still have to rest. You still have other obligations. So give yourself some realistic things. Otherwise, you know, and it's really hard to write for that long a period of time, especially if you're not doing it every day and you haven't created that habit. So again, try to find balance, try to create a habit, make sure you have passion and don't forget to have realistic expectations and don't forget to clear the coulda, woulda, shouldas. I know this was a really long tip for you, but I hope that you all found something helpful in that. Um, and of course, we'll be back next week with another episode here on the Writer's Parachute. And again, we want to thank Jen Selinski for joining us. We want to have her back to talk more about her other books in her amazing 200 Book Plus catalog. But until next time, we hope that all of your writing and publishing dreams land well. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to come back. All right. Well, we'll do that. So until next time, everybody. Bye.